some very important messages for us, I think, in what you've said, um, perhaps yet to be discovered. Perhaps the easiest thing is if I ask all of you to come mm -hmm. to the front, which is what was planned, and have a seat. And uh, that allows us the chance to have a sort of informal question and answer and discussion session. Um, maybe since, since I'm the chairman, I could take a small privilege and ask Professor Gerber the first question. Um, it's a little bit personal and from my point of view it's I suppose the question is how far can we go uh, with this concept of arrays uh, in AFM and could that free us from the need to have secondary antibody uh, binding and labeling and so forth. Clearly where nanoparticles are concerned um, the kinds of questions of affinity and so forth that we deal with are uh, much different from proteins. And we do need some new tools, but I think we probably need them many more channels, so to speak, than six or ten. Is there, is there a hope in the future? Of course, you, uh, I'm from a, from a mechanic. It's always hope. <laughs> <laughs> From a mechanical point of view, I mean, this is no problem. I mean, you can do this uh, arrays up to uh, thousands of them, you know. I mean, but the, it's just the readout mechanism, you know, has to be different, obviously, you know. I mean, for example, uh, rather than using a laser readout or is a piezo resistive readout would uh, be appropriate. I haven't talked about that, but uh, I mean, absolutely, that could be done. But whether it's feasible to do that, uh, I'm not so sure, you know. I mean, uh, uh, other projects uh, basically are, well, are not so successful in uh, actually uh, do that sort of thing. I'd rather have it uh, on a small uh, sort of array and sort of look into niche and not into... Uh, screening. Screening. Yeah. I don't think screening is... Uh, uh, what you want to do with this, you know. I mean, uh, just, just keep it small. Keep it small. <laughs> A typical Swiss, right? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. I don't think one should uh, upscale this uh, thing. Uh, right. I'll pursue you later about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, let me open now the, the discussion for other questions, please. Uh, thank you very much for these presentations, which really show that science coming from both ends, from uh, macro, from mechanics, and science coming from the bottom, immunology, uh, built-in mechanisms in life, or in this era, really meeting in the middle. We see that things which exist in immu immun immunology since ever can now be, in, be manufactured by technology, and we see that finally the mechanics which were thought of old physics are now really leading edge physics meeting the molecular detail. So I congratulate you to these uh, talks which really nice, which show really nice how you meet in the middle. And I am sure that this will have a profound influence on medicine which is actually the core thesis of this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Please. I have a rather naive question for the immunology, uh, immunity against virus. If the primary characteristic is the multimer nature of the virus, wouldn't one expect that evolution would make viruses lose this characteristic instead of seeing it over and over again? Not so naive. <laughs> No, you see, because a virus that is too successful and is destroying host cells simply would kill all its hosts. 
which is the end of the virus. But there are no naive questions in that. <laughs> so there really are no naive questions. You should uh, feel free to ask absolutely anything. Perhaps, yes, please. So actually I have a question to Professor Zinkenegger. Why the monomer doesn't induce a T-helper response? Well, you know, there we have to distinguish between non-self and let's say a bacterial toxin or something like this. Of course with a bacterial toxin, you know, because of the toxic effect, you will immediately get a inflammatory, let's call it milieu, where you have all these toll-like receptors and so on. So there the monomer is linked to the necessary signals. But for self antigens, serum albumin or transferrin or what the, you know, whatever you take, of course doesn't do that. Because there is no, the B cells may bind to that antigen but without any consequences. Because within the lymphatic tissue, there are no accompanying types of um, toll-like receptor or other signals generated. But if an you know, enormous infection gets associated with certain cell destructions of our body, then it's possible that actually because of that new strange environment, there may be autoimmune responses induced. So there is a thinking that autoimmune diseases never get induced in the absence of chronic inflammatory infectious disease triggered processes for that very reason. Maybe I could just follow up and ask how important this seven nanometer distance is and how, how precise it needs to be, firstly. And secondly, do we know anything about the uh, degree of compliance or rigidity that is required? I mean, of course, these are um, interesting aspects. Now, we, we are not as precise as <laughs> Yet. Okay. That's just <laughs> unfortunate. But we did a few titrations, um, and in fact, in the 60s, there was a couple of immunologists with the name Dinti at the NIH, and they used a hapton, a phenyl group. You know, that's sort of a, a favorite toy for academic immunologists. And they actually try to figure out with that lousy antigen, you know, how far apart mm. you can do it. And they sort of, you know, they were even less precise than we were, but they say so between 10 and 30 nanometers. 10 and, 10 th and 30. 3 zero. 3 zero. Ah. yeah. So, but I think, you know, they couldn't exclude coiling and, and, and sort mm. of, uh, you know, there's arrangement because they had linear molecules that they used. So we have the advantage of these surfaces. Now we compared viruses with a rigid surface like the rabies viruses, but measles virus, for example, has a less rigid surface. So when you look at that problem with a, a sort of more cell membrane-like viral um, More compliant. envelope, mm. which is a bit flexible, right. like a bilayer um, type of membrane, then the response is much, much less pronounced. So mm -hmm. it looks as if rigidity is, is, is necessary, and that as soon as this is weakened to approach cell surface type of characteristics, then this efficiency falls down. And this makes, in a way, a lot of sense because you don't want to kick off these B cells simply against all also repetitive but less ordered and less rigid molecules on a cell's surface. And in fact, it's extremely difficult, even against foreign transplantation antigens, to induce an antibody response. So, I mean, that's the general rule, mm -hmm. you know. 
The distance, 7 to 10 nanometers, um, we just, you know, like science goes, you know, we just make the calculations and it sort of fitted the distance in the antibody. So we took that, but we haven't done any... So that's not consistent with 10 to 30, right? No, but this is a lousy antigen on a linear molecule, okay. and that mm. molecule can, you know, co coil up, and so you can't make a statement, you know, there. Mm. But a viral antigen, I think it's just interesting that this number is not specific for, for these rabies viruses. And once the viral particle gets much smaller, let's say in the 50 nanometer type of, of, of size, then it looks as if it doesn't work any longer, probably because of the radial uh, sort of spreading. But these things have not been exactly done. I mean, one is tempted to ask you things about to what degree higher order patterning rather than just two-way distances but three-way and four-way distances to what degree that also is necessary in amplification and so forth well but there, I, uh, I think the evidence for that is that it's probably not one dimension is you quite think it's enough. enough and the classical example for that is actually the flagellin response on the salmonella, we saw one of, uh, of your mm. things very nicely on, on that flagella. You know, the distance of about seven to 10 nanometers from, from antigen to antigen is actually also has been measured and fits very nicely because these uh, flagella, flagellas actually also kick off the B cells like a charm. Yeah. Certainly if I were somewhat younger, I'd want to be a student with Professor Gerber and a postdoc with Professor Zinkernagel. I think I could put something very interesting together in that story. You. <laughs> I have a question to Professor Zinkernagel. What do you think about antibody response to engineered nanomaterials, you know, synthetic materials that come in different sizes and shapes, and some of them are made of polymers that have repeated structures and, you know, because they come in different sizes, uh, I'm sure, you know, one can engineer these uh, polymers to have, you know, certain distance apart, like 7 nanometers or 10 nanometers apart. And yet, um, so far, there is handful of studies that would describe antiparticle-specific immune response. People struggle generating antibodies to nanoparticles. Is it a matter of detection? We cannot detect antibodies accurately, or is it somehow the immune system, you know, these particles are protected uh, from the immune system? No, no, of course, you know, when you do a presentation like this, you, you take a, what the ophthalmologist calls a, a rather um, small viewing field. And I think nano has many aspects. One important one of nano is simply to have basically a, a piece that has antigens on it. Let's say in immunology and clinical medicine, people use aluminum powder to absorb antigens to make a better vaccine. There's nothing else than simply creating particles that macrophages like to chew up. So there's certainly that part. But there you never get an IgM response, which is very interesting. So the IgM response in particular seems to be very much dependent on that 7 to 10 nanometer rigid type of cross-linking, let's call it, of the B cell receptor. I have a feeling that we're going to see soon a lot of interesting things come out about this question. I think it's been early, but I you think, see, I think I, we're going to see it no, soon. When I did <clears throat> studies with uh, some postdocs and doctoral students, we tried very hard to find a chemist who would construct us two or three dimensional lattices with defined distances. Mm. Excellent. Please. So this is probably a pretty bizarre question, um, but this is for Professor Gerber. Uh, measuring pH with an AFM, 
we can now start to look at chemical changes, we can look at chemical structural changes, but I haven't seen anyone actually measure pH in the, I'll call it the nano domain, the atomic domain, in relationship not only to a molecule, but in relationship to the, the surface of a cell as well. And do you have any thoughts on that or any suggestions on how to do that from where you're sitting? You, you, you basically mean in sensing, right? Not, yeah. not, not in uh, imaging also. I mean, we've done that in sensing. Yeah. I mean, and we published this, you know, but, but, uh, but not uh, using uh, uh, actually the uh, AFM uh, as an imaging tool rather yeah. than what I showed here. I mean, you absolutely can do that with it. It's no problem. To do, uh, to do this work on pH. Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah, getting back to endocytosis. Huh? Um, the, there's different rates of endocytosis. Transferrin receptors seem to uh, uh, have a, like maybe a two minute uh, uptake and then LDL receptors may take uh, uh, an hour or so. Do you have an explanation for any of these uh, varying rates? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, transferrin receptor follow the, uh, <clears throat> the clathrin mediated uh, uh, endocytosis, and uh, even uh, studying specifically the clathrin mediated endocytosis, uh, it has been uh, shown that um, uh, it might uh, the time of uh, uh, of endocytosis uh, or budding of the or constriction and budding of the pit from the surface uh, might differ uh, <coughs> uh, depending on which ligand uh, uh, will uh, accumulate in the pit and uh, and its co concentration. So uh, so there seem to be um, uh, that uh, the cargo might uh, uh, determine. Uh, the, the time it takes uh, for a clattering coated bit to to constrict from from the surface. So you mean that the, the transferring uh, protein uh, is much smaller than say an LDL, and now you've got a size dependence for how the the pit forms and then transports into the cell. Yes, okay. uh, and and also. Um, when it comes to the EGF recept, uh, binding of EGF and, uh, and uh, uptake of EGF receptors, uh, uh, they also, um, um, as you know, have to uh, uh, dimerize and, uh, and uh, oh. elicit um, uh, tyrosine phosphorylation, which also uh, takes time. There is a very clear size dependence in particles, for example, so there's no doubt of that effect. And there is also the recruitment question, which is somewhat connected, but also perhaps different. Maybe um, I could just ask you to comment on something that I think is beginning to unfold, but maybe hasn't been made concrete yet, which is just how dramatically nanoparticles can disturb the trafficking pathway. Um, yeah. And I think we're all hesitating to speak lightly about it but yeah that's uh, an indication that we that we have that um, that it seems like uh, uh, when they accumulate in in endosomes they uh, they uh, can disturb uh, natural uh, trafficking of natural ligands within the cell mm. even though we in um, uh, in our uh, studies we we couldn't see that that it affected the cell growth or proliferation. Right. But, but, it, uh, but it's happening. It's happening, definitely. And our tools to see what the consequences are are still fairly primitive. Yeah, so there may be something. I think it's something uh, one should look more uh, into. Absolutely. Please. So I also have a question to Dr. Iverson. So you uh, concluded that polymeric uh, nanoparticles cannot uh, endocytose in vivo. So you put in your slide. Uh, what was the basis of that conclusion? That they cannot uh, endocytose. They or cannot escape from the endosome in vivo. This was for the... The endolysis uh, almost passed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yes. Uh, this, uh, pro I think uh, this protein sponge effect and, 
and that it's so dramatic that, that you have rupture of, uh, of uh, the late endosome uh, where uh, these uh, cationic uh, polymers accumulate. That has, uh, uh, there have been a couple of studies quite recently uh, uh, indicating that, uh, that it's not actually uh, a rupture uh, of the endosomes going on, that, uh, but that uh, the polymers uh, might uh, in some way translocate uh, through uh, the endosomal membrane. So I just wanted to turn your attention to some other, other work, which it's very much depending on the, on the amount of the, of the polymer. And for example, we have shown several times, and including yesterday in vivo, that in two photon microscopy in live animals, that this polymeric uh, nanoparticle can go into live Langerhans cells and go to the nucleus, deliver the payload in the nucleus. So uh, I, would not, I would be very careful concluding that this uh, is not happening in vivo. Yeah, so that's interesting. I haven't uh, uh, seen that, uh, your publication. Uh, so. Uh, uh, but, uh, the ne nevertheless, are... that may not be synonymous with escape from the endolysosomal pathway. It could be that there are really, as we've noticed, simply different trafficking pathways that open up, which yeah, are that's, independent. Uh, if they go all the way to the nucleus, uh, it's uh, not. Uh, do you have you addressed whether they uh, they they first translocate into the cytoplasm and, and from there uh, go further to the nucleus or are they, uh, can you it's follow a lot of the work. Process? A lot of work, and it's not only my work, it is just uh, a lot of work has been done that it, it, and it goes to the endosome, escapes from the endosome. We are doing uh, uh, DNA polyethylene in manos, nanoparticle. And, uh, and in vivo, in live animal, in Langerhans cells, it is beautifully shown that it is enters to the, to the, so it is in the, in the nuclear area. So not yeah. definitely not staying in the endosome. So mm. that, I just mm. wanted to say this oh. is definitely escaping from the endosome. Exactly. This so, nanoparticle. Hmm, interesting. But just so. to comment that we have, we have seen certainly non-RAB5, RAB7 pathways open up as a consequence of proteins that are brought into the cell from a bio biological milieu. So it is not impossible that you're seeing alternative pathways opening up that are not escape from endosomal pathway, but are actually differently RAB driven. Yeah, it's it feasible. Yeah. We don't know. But, but uh, to imagine that you have a first uh, rupture and entry into the cytoplasm and then uh, uh, by some diffusion of these macromolecules, transport into the nucleus. Uh, I think that's a process that, that will take uh, a lot of time, uh, unless there are some active uh, transport mechanisms uh, that, uh, transporting them towards the, the nucleus. I think perhaps um, this has been a wonderful session. I would like to thank all of you for, I, I must say, a truly memorable set of lectures for me. And uh, we'd like to acknowledge that by the usual way. And now we have our two key uh, sponsors of the whole meeting are going to close. We have learned a lot at this meeting. One thing we have learned tonight is that what we could observe 20, 30 years ago in nature, but were not able to manufacture, we are now able to control at the molecular scale. And for this reason, I really believe that there may even be a new era of immunology, where we can not only induce immune cell responses, but we can also play at the molecular level with such, such systems and maybe got, uh, get more insights about the nature of uh, our body and find new ways to treat our patients. What we have also learned in this conference is that to make a step forward in medicine, interdisciplinarity and basic research is of key importance. The interaction of scientists, uh, pharmaceutics, 
regulatory bodies and politics is also important that we can go a step forward to make very interesting research, but also to help our patients and help our societies and help developing countries. So I thank you for your persistence in staying here, for your interest in this field, and I hope that we will meet again next year. And I give now the word to Beat. For me, it is an honor to thank all those speakers who committed themselves to come to Basel to take long trips and short trips, to come here, to exchange knowledge. And we have, after this conference, with almost 500 people of the community, decided that we will do another conference next year. We will do it from June 22nd to 25. So always on the preceding Sunday of those three days, starting with the assemblies. And we are very grateful and look forward to furthering the field to the benefit of the patient and mankind to research in this field and to go on as we have done in the last six years. Thank you. Uh, and don't forget, don't forget, everybody is invited tonight who st still stays here, Beat, 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 everybody is invited. Oh, of course, you know that most of you were now at the, uh, have now written your name in. All people are invited that are staying here for dinner. It's a light dinner, it's the f classical farewell dinner. And we would be delighted to see you all. <clears throat> and the last hand for these promoters and everyone involved in the organization of the meeting. Then, 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 then. <laughs> Beat, 